Kicking off the list at number 10, boiling. Whenever I get in a bath that's too hot, I think of the medieval times. I can't help it. I can't believe this was once a real thing. I get chills thinking about it. Either water or oil would be used for this ancient punishment. To die by being boiled, that was reserved for those who poisoned others. So if you have any vials of poison, toss it. Don't do it, man. Trust me. In 1531, the time King Henry VIII was running the show, they made boiling a capital punishment. So poisoning somebody back then was equal to treason. Therefore, it was agreed you should be boiled slowly in front of like a room full of people. I would say that's the worst, but I know what's also to come on this list. Number nine, water. Taking a step away from the worst physical thing one could possibly go through, let's take a look at how far the mind will go before it too breaks. Sensory deprivation is still around today. In fact, there's many who pay for it. Yeah, they lie in a dark tub full of salt, then they float and listen to Childish Gambino. It's a magical experience. Your senses are powerful, especially combined with water. So this dripping machine, this old water punishment, that was just all bad. You had ice cold water dripping on your forehead and your face over and over for hours and hours. Drops would be at different random times so you can predict it as well. My toes are wiggling while I'm talking about this. This is making me anxious right now. In medieval times, they would tie you down and then using a horn, a big ass funnel, they would pour nine pints of water down into your, down your, down your throat. So water is horrible in many ways. Number eight, fire. Can't talk about medieval punishments without mentioning this witchy classic. Commonly practiced in Babylonia and ancient Israel, then later on in Europe with the classic witch hunts, burning at the stake didn't come from churches, like many believe. They didn't call the shots there at all. That was mainly how small towns settled local beef. Yeah, by burning at the stake, instead of just like a fist fight at the park. Burning at the stake came in full swing way back in 1431 in France. French disbelievers like Joan of Arc, they were burned at the stake. It was crazy that they actually did this as a form of punishment. This is one of the worst medieval punishments. And believe me, there's a little bit of a silver lining here. It was quicker than most. Sometimes. Gunpowder was sometimes used so that the burning and stuff would be much faster and brighter and louder and much more horrible. A lot worse on paper, but a lot faster. So honestly, I think it's better. History is insane. Another red hot punishment used in medieval times was when the accused had to hold a red hot iron bar and then walk a few steps with it. A red hot iron bar, your hands were literally toast at that point. Here's where it gets even worse though. Three days later, the accused would come back to the court and then when the bandages were removed, if their hands were healing, they started to heal, they were deemed innocent. They were on the path to goodness and whatever. If their hands were still in horrible condition from say, I don't know, holding a red hot iron bar, then they were pronounced guilty. That's how the courts worked back then. Number seven, the rack. On to something not so hot and fast, but rather dull and slow, the rack is surprisingly well known. It was originally introduced to the Tower of London around 1420. The Duke of Exeter referred to this device as his daughter. What a weirdo. It's like guys who call their car like she. It's like, okay, just a little bit too close to your automobile, man. Relax. It was an open bed frame type device where your ankles were tied at the bottom and your hands were tied at the top. Already we're off to a horrible start. It was horizontal as well and sometimes it was up. It was, it was all bad. They would just leave you hanging by these ropes and these ropes were slowly tightened more and more, obviously causing some problems to muscles and joints that were, you know, holding things in place. This was done to extract information. This is also one of the worst things I've heard. Even getting tickled like this would be horrible. I couldn't even imagine. I make jokes because I'm uncomfortable, honestly. Hit that thumbs up to spread some good vibes because we're not even halfway done, folks. Number six, molten metal. This was another form of cow capital punishment, and if you've seen Game of Thrones, it'll ring a familiar bell. A few of these do, actually, yikes. Metal would be heated up in a cauldron for a long, long time to the point where it was liquid, it was molten metal, just a soup of minerals. Look, we said this video wasn't for the faint-hearted, and here at Bumblebee, we like to keep that promise. They would then pour the molten metal on your head, or more commonly known, this would they pour it down the throat of the accused. Obviously, it wasn't done as a method to extract information, it was done to brutally end someone's life. Because they're not talking after that, of course. Execution by molten metal was supposedly done to a wealthy Roman general, Marcus Licinius Crassus, back in ancient times. The metal would burn your muscles and skin, literally cooking it, and then after a few moments, it would harden. Bad, bad, not good. Number five keel hauling. Not to be confused with kegels, keel hauling was reserved for the worst of the worst at sea. This was used by pirates for sailors who disobeyed orders and all that jazz. The victim would be suspended by a rope with rocks or weights around their ankles, then they're lowered to the keel of the ship where all the sharp barnacles live after so long 
these ships are so old, it's just piled on layers and layers of barnacles. Then they would get dragged all along them with the water and everything. Water plus pain, it's a lot, it's a deadly combination. Anything to do with barnacles in the sea, no chance. I'll literally tell you anything, Blackbeard. Anything. Number four, solitary confinement. This is a kind of punishment that still exists in our modern society, but it can truly be one of the worst punishments out there because of the type of psychological distress that it causes. We were all just in a pandemic for so long. We got so bored and we had Netflix and iPads and I whatevers. I can't even imagine this back in the day. Basically, it's a prisoner living in a single cell with little to no contact with anybody else. Not even like a guard or anything rattling keys like in the old times. It was just nothing. No one would even check on them. There are many stories about people being locked up for so long they forget about their families. And some people have gone away to solitary confinement for so long that once they're out, they just forget how to speak, really. They forget how to be a human and interact in the real world. Solitary confinement and the negative effects that it has on a person is becoming a wider topic of conversation because of the effects on a person's mental well-being, and it's a topic for a lot of human rights organizations. Back in medieval times, solitary confinement was literally just a room made of stones. It was pitch black, freezing cold, you were tucked away below some janky castle, and most of the time, you weren't really alone. In the dark, nibbling away your little piggies were number three rats another game of thrones classic if you're a rat person i know there's a lot of people who do tricks with their pet rat that's cool but maybe cover stuart little's eyes for this one rats as a medieval punishment where do i even start okay this one was a punishment for the rats at the same time what was once called a rat trap involved a man or woman being tied down to something and then a metal enclosure would be strapped down to their chest or their stomach now inside this metal enclosure there's rats which are also just loose walking around and the person can feel them the little feet walking around in their skin and this is when the person and still in the punishment begins heating the other end of the metal enclosure historically it was hot coals that were usually placed on top or there's a fire underneath which quickly creates a hot environment for the rats inside from there, the rats begin frantically searching for a way out, but because it's made of metal and they can't bite through that, they find your skin, and then that, they can obviously bite through. So, you can paint the picture in your head, it's disgusting. Number two, the breaking wheel. The breaking wheel is literally just a large disc, a pirate ship wheel almost, just lying there, where somebody is then tied to it, and everybody else just hammers them and beats the out of them over and over. But of course, since we're talking about medieval times, everything has to be a show and whatnot. So once the accused was beaten and then presumed dead, the wheel would lift up and turn just to show everybody what's up. Another way to use the breaking wheel, yep, there was more than one, again, creative folks back then, they would tie a person to the wheel and then continue to rotate it and then all the ropes below would get tighter and tighter and twist. Kind of like the rack, but with a literal twist. And finally coming in at number one, the brazen bull. This one takes the rat's problem and then makes it a you problem. Out of all the ones on this list, the brazen bull is the last one that I would do straight up haunting. It's also been referred to as a Sicilian bull and basically it's not too complex. There is a bronze sculpture often in the shape of, you guessed it, a bull. But in medieval times, it was just a big closed cauldron and usually it was large enough to fit a person inside. Yeah, this was in a Saw movie too, I believe. That's how you know it's a good one when it's in the movie Saw. So once the person was locked inside or it was leaned over so they couldn't get out, a fire would then be set underneath this bull and then you can probably figure out the rest in your head. They would even engineer the bull so that when somebody screamed it sounded like a bull's roar. How fun is that? How fun is history? I'm learning so much about history that's fun on Bumblebee. At number 10, population. It's pretty messed up just how many slaves there were in ancient Rome. In their society, wealthy people owned dozens if not hundreds of slaves to do their menial work. In ancient Rome, anyone could be sold into slavery. No matter your race or background, if you could work, you could be bought and sold. Historians believe that about 90% of the free people in Italy by the first century BCE had ancestors who were slaves. At one point, the Roman Senate debated having slaves wear uniforms to be able to distinguish them from the rest of society, but they ultimately decided against it when they realized just how many slaves there were. One ancient Roman politician once said, quote, It was once proposed in the Senate that slaves should be distinguished from free people by their dress. But then it was realized how great and danger this would be if our slaves began to count us. End quote. They literally couldn't afford to let the slaves know how many other slaves there were because if they would have known they outnumbered the other members of society, this could have led to a revolt. I mean, there were slave revolts regardless, but we will get to that later. At number nine, lifestyle. Ancient Roman slaves experienced different lifestyles and living conditions based on a number of factors, often linked to their occupations. Slaves who didn't have a specific skill or trade were often 
been used in mines and agriculture, and those were the harshest conditions that they could have been subjected to. Oftentimes, they were literally worked to death, and since they didn't have any human rights in the eyes of the Romans, they were often overlooked and simply replaced. On the other hand, household slaves received more humane treatment. They were treated better by their masters, and sometimes they were able to get some money in order to buy their freedom. If they were able to buy their freedom, the slaves would become freedmen, which was a social class between slaves and free people. Before we continue discussing the hard lives of slaves in ancient Rome, make sure you guys smash that thumbs up button if you're thoroughly entertained so far, and maybe even consider subscribing to the channel to see more videos like this one. At number 8, Spartacus. At one point, a group of Roman slaves revolted, and though they eventually lost their battle, they survived a pretty long time thanks to one famous slave named Spartacus. Spartacus was a slave who escaped a gladiatorial training camp and recruited thousands of other slaves to fight for their freedom alongside him. For the slaves, Spartacus was their symbol of hope and their leader. This slave army was able to defy Roman authorities for two years with freedom in their sights, but unfortunately those dreams were crushed when Roman general Crassus crushed Spartacus and his army. After Spartacus Spartacus was killed, the authorities came for the rest of the slaves in the army and they were severely punished. 6,000 slaves who took part in the revolt were crucified and this was almost a warning to the other slaves against trying to revolt again. Spartacus became a legend but it wasn't enough to free the Roman slaves. At number 7, Ownership In ancient Rome, slavery and slave ownership was such a common practice that pretty much everyone owned slaves, regardless of social status. Even some of the poorest Roman citizens would own one or two slaves. Obviously, the more money you had back then, the more slaves you could afford. In Roman Egypt, the average artisan owned about two or three slaves each. Emperor Nero was known to have owned over 400 slaves who lived and worked in his home in the city, but his numbers are eclipsed by a wealthy Roman named Gaius Caecilius Isidorus, who according to historical records owned 4,166 slaves at the time of his death. That just gives you an idea of just how many people were sold into slavery in the first place. At number 6, freedom. Earlier I mentioned that Roman slaves had the chance to buy their freedom. It was a lengthy process, but this gave a lot of slaves hope for a better life. Things weren't always better after buying their freedom though, and many of them sold themselves back into slavery because things were tough. The process of buying your freedom as a slave was called manumission. This could be achieved in a number of ways. Slave master could grant their slave freedom as a reward for their service and loyalty. The slave could pay their master a sum of money to be freed, or sometimes a slave master could just find it convenient to let their slave go. Most slave masters who chose that last option to free their slave for their own benefit were merchants who needed someone to be able to sign contracts on their behalf. And since slaves weren't allowed to represent their masters from a legal standpoint, they would be freed, but would still work for their master. You also had to be over the age of 30 to buy your freedom, so if you were lucky to live that long, then there was hope of being freed, but with the average life expectancy in ancient Rome being about 28 years or so, and with the living conditions of many slaves, they would be lucky to get that opportunity. At number 5, Demand In ancient Rome, there was an incredibly high demand for slaves, but since there were so many slaves in Rome, there was always work for them. Oftentimes, people sold themselves or their children into slavery in order to pay off their debts, so when it came to being bought, that came pretty easy. Other than public office, slaves were used for almost every activity in ancient Rome. The most common slave trade was mining because workers were always in demand, mostly due to the high level of danger that came with the job, and the fact that many slaves were injured or died while working in the mines, and slave masters needed to keep replacing those who could no longer work. Domestic labor and farming were also high demand jobs for slaves back then. Back then, the law the logic behind using slave labor for these types of jobs was that, quote, free labor should be used in unhealthy places. End quote. Basically, they believed that it was better to have a slave pass away on the job than a free person because it would impact their business less. At number 4, Procurement The way that slaves were acquired in ancient Rome was pretty messed up, I will say. Typically, slaves were acquired through four different ways. They would be brought in as war captives, as victims of pirate raids, by trade, or by breeding. During the early expansion of the Roman Empire, many war captives were turned into slaves. The pirates from Sicilia, located in what is now modern-day Turkey, did business with the Romans and supplied them with a lot of their slaves. The pirates would bring their slaves to the island of Delos, which back then was considered considered to be the international center of slave trading. The slave trade was such a big deal back then that it has been recorded that on at least one occasion, 10,000 people were traded as slaves and shipped back to Italy in one day. 
This was a big business opportunity for a lot of people, but of course, no one ever considered the lives of the people they were buying and selling. At number three, fugitives. As you could imagine, life as a slave in ancient Rome or at any period of time wasn't easy. Living conditions were poor, it was dangerous, and no one should ever be treated like that or used for free labor. Many slaves have been known to escape, and obviously the same went for those in ancient Rome. Slaves running away from their masters was a common thing back then, and to deal with it, slave owners would hire professional slave catchers to hunt down, capture, and return the escaped slave back to their owner. For slave owners who wanted to take matters into their own hands, they would advertise rewards for those who could return their slaves, or they would just try and locate their slave themselves. Some slave owners had ways of preventing their slaves from getting away, like using collars with instructions on where to return the escaped slave, much like a dog collar, which is just dehumanizing. At number two, revolts. In Roman times, slave revolts were pretty common. There have been a number of recorded slave revolts in Roman history. I mentioned the one that was led by Spartacus, but there's another pretty famous Roman slave revolt that was led by a man named Eunice. Eunice led a revolt that happened in Sicily from 135 to 132 BCE. It is said that Eunice believed himself to be a prophet and claimed to have several mystical visions. Eunice was able to persuade a number of other slaves to follow him when he performed a trick where sparks and flames came out of his mouth. They believed that he was magical and so they followed him to try and fight back against the Roman forces. Unfortunately, they were defeated, but the example that they set is believed to have inspired yet another slave revolt in Sicily later in 104 to 103. BCE. And finally, at number one, totally normal. Probably the most messed up thing about life as a Roman slave was just how normal slavery was in society. I mean, the Roman people were so invested in their slaves that they continuously tried to crush their revolts and they tried everything in their power to keep them from escaping. Even the sheer number of slaves that were in their society just shows how important slavery was to them. Back then, slavery was just an unquestioned institution. For many, it was just a normal part of life, which is actually quite frightening when you think about it. There is no recorded history of Romans ever questioning slavery in their society, and all economic, legal, and social forces in Rome at this time worked hard to try and preserve slavery as part of their society. To the ancient Romans, slaves were seen as the direct opposite of free people, which they believed was a necessary balance that they needed in their society. They never completely got rid of slavery either. Though they did try and create new rules and laws to make life as a slave more bearable, they were still bought and sold into servitude and were seen as property and lesser people. Starting off this list, in our number 10 spot, we have scaphism. All right, you guys, this one is also known as the boats or being eaten alive. And really, whatever way you swing it, it absolutely sucks so badly. This is an ancient method of execution that involved putting someone sandwiched between two boats stacked on top of one another. From here, they'll feed the person and cover them in milk and honey, and then they just leave them. From here, the substance is on and in the person will fester and attract bugs and other small vermin, which will then basically eat that person who can't fend for themselves alive. Not only would being eaten alive be one of the worst ways to go, but this process was in incredibly lengthy and ensured the person suffered for a really long time. Like, we're talking over 10 days here. In one of the first written mentions of scaphism, which comes from Plutarch in the life of Artaxerxes, while talking about the execution of Mithridates, he said, quote, when the man is manifestly dead, the uppermost boat being taken off, they find his flesh devoured and swarms of such noisome creatures preying upon and, as it were, growing to his inwards. In this way, Mithridates, after suffering for 17 days at last expired. So uh, yeah, anyway, if Plutarch wants to go pay for my therapy after that, I'd be really grateful. In our number nine spot today, we have drawn and quartered. This was a popular form of punishment and became the statutory penalty for men who were convicted of high treason in the Kingdom of England from 1352, although this form of punishment certainly existed well before that. Basically, whoever the convicted was, they would be secured to some sort of wooden panel and then drawn by horse to wherever this whole thing was going down. That wasn't said casually to make light of this horrible punishment, I'm just uncomfy, so I'm trying to keep it cool and casual. So once at the place of execution, the person would then be hanged, almost to the point of them losing their life, but from there, they would then be emasculated, for lack of a better term, disemboweled, beheaded, and then quartered, or 
chopped into four pieces. All right, and because this simply wasn't enough for some insane reason, the pieces would then be displayed in prominent places across the country. Like, no, I do not want to see someone's upper right quadrant while going for breakfast. I'll pass on that. Thank you so much, though. In our number eight spot today, we have Mazatello. This one was a method of capital punishment that was occasionally used by the Papal States for only some of the most terrible crimes or crimes that were considered especially loathsome. Basically, the person who was being executed would be led to a scaffold that was located in the public square because they didn't have Netflix back then, so instead they just watched people die. I don't know, it was weird. I'll keep watching Ginny and Georgia instead. But anyway, the person would be accompanied by a priest, and on this scaffold would lie a coffin and a masked executioner who was dressed in black. A prayer would be said for the soul of the condemned, and then when the time came, the executioner would swing a mallet into the air and then bring it down on the head of the prisoner. Sometimes this one blow would be enough to take their lives, and sometimes it would merely render them unconscious, which would then lead to their throat being cut. None of this sounds good. This one sucks so bad. I feel bad giving you guys this information. Next video, can it be like top 10 nice, cool, wonderful flowers or something instead? Top 10 dogs. Let's do that. In our number seven spot today, we have the blood eagle. This messed up thing was a ritual method of execution that was detailed in late skaldic poetry. In the two instances, where this horrible punishment was mentioned, the victims, who both happened to be members of the royal family, were placed in the prone position. They were lying flat on their tummies, they had their ribs severed from their spine using a sharp tool, and then they had their lungs pulled out through the opening to create a sort of super messed up and really scary and terrifying pair of wings. Both instances where this insane punishment is said to have happened, the person was being punished for patricide or for killing their own father, so I guess definitely don't do that. I'm not really sure what the takeaway from this one is other than, wow, that sounds horrible and I'm really glad we don't do that anymore. I also really love my dad. In our number six spot today, we have keel hauling. This is a word that I wish I could erase from my vocabulary as it has to do with one of the most terrible punishments I've ever heard of. But I mean, I guess we've already talked about a bunch of these, so I should be used to it by now. The word for this punishment comes from the Dutch word keel hallen, which apparently means to drag along the keel. And that is exactly what this terrible method was all about. This punishment was usually reserved for sailors, and they would be stripped, tied, and suspended by rope from the mast of the ship with weights tied to their legs. The rope would be looped beneath the ship so that once the tied up sailor is released, they'd be dragged under the keel of the ship. In the world of the most unsurprising news ever, this method had basically a 100% fatality rate. Wow. It's almost as if you put someone in that situation that threatens their life in multiple ways, they just might not survive. How strange. In our number five spot today, we have the ducking stools. This was a punishment used in the 16th and 17th century England in New England, and it was usually a punishment that was reserved for women. This punishment was given to a woman for doing what was considered unwomanly, whatever that is supposed to mean. Apparently, this included things like having an argument with their husband, fighting with the neighbors, gossiping, and backstabbing. Whoever made these rules had clearly never met a man because newsflash, everyone does literally all of those things. But hey, clearly the logic used in the past was not logical. Basically, this punishment would see a woman being tied up to a stool and then dropped into a lake or stream over and over again. This was actually a punishment method that didn't usually end up in death, but that sounds like the worst consolation prize of all time. In our number four spot today, we have trial by ordeal. This one is aptly named because it really was a whole entire ordeal and one that I'm sure absolutely none of us would have liked to have been a part of. This foolproof ancient judicial practice was used as a test to determine whether someone was innocent or guilty. Spoiler alert, it was in fact not foolproof at all. In fact, it makes absolutely zero sense. Basically, the accused would be placed in the center of everyone and they would have severe pain inflicted upon them in a multitude of ways. If they survived the pain, they were innocent, and if they didn't, they were guilty. Like, what kind of insanity is that? Apparently, there were a multitude of different ordeals people could be subjected to, like cold water, hot water, hot iron, really whatever option, they were all bad. What an insane idea to test someone's innocence. I'm just saying, I know a lie detector test is only 80 to 90% accurate, but I'll take that over this ordeal. In our number three spot today, we have death by elephants. There's a lot of messed up punishments we 
we've talked about, but this one makes me extra angry because why do we need to include poor innocent animals in our terrible behavior? You know what I mean? Execution by elephant was quite a popular method of capital punishment in certain parts of the world. The elephants would be used to crush, dismember, or just inflict pain on captives who were being publicly executed. This method was most commonly used by royalty because it was a way they could use the elephants to signify both the ruler's power as well as their ability to control a wild animal. This practice began to die out in the 18th and 19th century as the parts of the world that used this method began to be colonized. Elephants were the chosen animal in part because of their size and strength, but also because of their intelligence, domestic ability, and versatility. Although bears and lions were more popularly used in other parts of the world, elephants had the ability to be trained to execute the person in a variety of different ways because they are so smart. I feel bad for the people who died like this, but I also feel really bad for the elephants who were forced to take part as well. In our number two spot today, we have the breaking wheel. All right, folks, buckle up for this one that was once used as a method of capital punishment. This method was most commonly used in Europe from antiquity through the Middle Ages and into the early modern period. This was a super simple device and it really was just a wheel, but it was absolutely terrible. There are two different methods with the breaking wheel. Either the person would be broken on the wheel or by the wheel. So basically, excuse the gruesome descriptions, but if you were broken by the wheel, basically you'd be placed belly down on a board and then the wheel was slammed down twice on each arm and leg and then on the spine. You'd then be tied to the wheel and hammered to a pole. The pole would be put up for the victim to be left up there to die. Yeah. I know, I said it was gruesome, and we still have another one to get through. Being broken on the wheel involved the limbs of the victim being tied to the wheel and then smashed with a club, and in some places the wheel would spin, just to add a little extra terribleness. The number and the sequence in which the smashes were distributed were not random, however, as they were actually determined in a court sentencing. All right, let's keep going, we're almost done. In our number one spot today, we have rats. Man, this one really sums up how terrible human beings can be. Rat torture originally originated in ancient Rome and ever since then it unfortunately has been a part of the most horrible, gruesome punishments. What was once called a rat trap involved a man being tied down to something and then a metal enclosure being strapped to his abdomen or chest. Inside this enclosure there were rats, which the strapped down person can feel walking around and this is when the person instilling the punishment begins heating the other end of the metal enclosure. Historically hot coals were usually placed on top, which of course very quickly creates a hot environment for the rat inside. From here, the rats begin frantically searching for a way out because, just like us, they have survival instincts. The metal enclosure is too hard to bite into, but a human's flesh is not. Well, you see where this is going. I don't need to say more, but just know that it is very, very painful and very, very horrible. And to make matters worse, this is only one of the terrible rat punishments there have been throughout history. So maybe if there's a part two of this video, we'll talk about another one. How fun would that be? Number 10 is sumptuary laws, which are the most common kind of medieval law. Defined as laws made for the purpose of restraining luxury or extravagance, particularly against inordinate expenditures for apparel, food, for an and etc. Sumptuary laws were enacted for the purpose of regulating trade, but also regulate and reinforce social hierarchies by restricting foods, clothing, and luxury items. They did this so it was easy to identify someone's social rank and privilege in the name of good old fashioned social discrimination and class division. Bourgeoisie subjects appearing to be as wealthy or as wealthier than ruling nobility could undermine the royals' presentations as the most powerful in the land. Why, that could cause traitors and thieves and revolts. In late medieval cities, sumptuary laws were instituted as a way for nobility to limit the conspicuous consumption of everyone, most specifically the prosperous bourgeoisie, while still making it about poor commoners enough for it to slip past them while they were busy poking fun at those below them, they missed out what the royals sneakily did above them. Cowardice tax law is number 9. Medieval knights weren't always volunteered. In fact, a grand majority of many kingdoms functioned off of what was essentially a draft drafting of their men into the service. So it makes sense that not everyone was as passionate about the idea of sieges or holy crusades or anything that could really get them wiped out in the name of a cause.
cause that just wasn't for them. So while it could be considered a great honor to be called to battle, and you wanted to shirk your duty of obligation, you technically were able to pay a scourge, aka the cowardice tax, which originated in 1100. Essentially a get out of jail free card that you paid for with your own wage, royalty started to lean into this new tax source, and by the 13th century it had evolved into a generalized tax on the knight's land. When the scourge tax reached 300%, the result of one king's want to force those to serve him all in a total Icarus flies too close to the sun fashion, it led to the implementation of the Magna Carta, which was forced onto royalty in the times to stunt their seemingly endless control and dictatorship. Sports banning is number 8, you've heard it in some of our other medieval videos, but we'll dive more into it now. Soccer and tennis were two banned sports of the medieval era. Handball, club ball, which is essentially baseball, hand fighting, which we could call boxing I guess. This law, which was made in 1485, was due to the belief that British men were losing their legendary archery skills, and also that these sports led to the sin of gambling. Obviously the rules didn't apply to royalty really, so tennis actually became an exclusively upper class sport for its etiquette, complex rules, and equipment requirements. Meanwhile football, as you may already know, was absolutely brutal. There was violence leading up to deaths and serious injuries, and it was often played drunk and recklessly. In 1388 a national statute demanded that servants and laborers throughout the country stop playing football and other sports and practice archery instead, the latter being necessary for the defense of the realm. They reopened the law in 1410 to add the punishment of six days imprisonment for violating this rule. Even then it was only enforced sporadically as royals were still depicted playing this game during the time of its illegality. Unlike others, this, this law obviously is not still in place today. This older legislation concerning unlawful games was repealed in 1845. Number 7 says you're not for the streets if you do these things in them. There were a few smaller rules written in correlation with street behavior in medieval times. While it was okay to toss your feces just about anywhere, in 1839 a law imposed it be illegal to beat or shake any carpet or rug in the street. You can shake your doormat, however, but only before 8am in the morning. No carolers allowed then. It was illegal to sing songs and ballads in the street, especially if it was profane. And if you were to disturb the people by ringing doorbells or knocking on doors unexpectedly and unwantedly, you could be fined. Try enforcing that on Halloween. Meanwhile, in Scotland, it is still illegal to date to turn someone away if they knock at your door and ask to use your bathroom, no matter the time, place, age, or person. Spotted in a crowd is unfortunately number six. Why unfortunately? Well, another fun, sumptuary law, and one of the earliest ever made in Europe, governed the appearance of minorities and social groups. Enacting laws stating specific dress codes for religions such as Jews or Muslims so that they were easily to be identified from other people. In English colonies, Muslims were told to wear a crescent shaped brooch or badge while Jews had to wear a similar badge as well as a ring and a yellow cone shaped hat. Yeah, I'd say that's pretty noticeable in a crowd. Alongside people who were Muslim or Jewish, the royals regulated laws of fashion towards people with certain diseases, those not following Christianity as a religion, orphans, and women of the night. Essentially, as you can tell, these were the unwanted peoples in the kingdom. So unfortunately, as mentioned, the point of these garbs was to make these people noticeable as social outcasts, so they may face mockery and degradation they didn't deserve for just simply existing. Number 5 is the Russian beard tax. Alright, so this technically was just outside the realm of medieval times and into middle times, but in 1698, Russian Emperor Peter the Great placed a tax on beards, hoping to force men to adopt the clean shaven look that was common in Western Europe. Peter's goal was to shift Russia to an Eurocentric visual. His return from a two year escapade in Europe had him changing up the fashion trends as well, replacing their long familiar Russian overcoats with French or Hungarian style jackets. They were shorter in length. It meant anyone walking the streets in an old fashioned robe was liable to have it cut short by Peter's designated fashion inspectors. The same inspectors would approach any bearded man they saw, requesting to see his beard token, a silver coin with a leafed edge, and in the center, a mustache, nose, and beard. This token was given to men who had paid their legally mandated beard tax for the year. No token provided when asked, doesn't matter if you forgot it at home. The inspectors would cut your beard off on the spot or simply rip it out of your face. The Russian Orthodox Church, which hated Peter the Great, saw this as a downright scandal as their teachings considered uncut facial hair a reflection of piety, seeing as man was created in the image of God, which included a beard. To shave it was a grave sin, but the church never really could stop Peter or his wily goals. This beard tax remained in place until 1772. Nowadays, these beard tokens are actually extremely rare 
collectibles, selling for as much as $10,000 in auctions today. Number four tells you don't mess with royal animals. Whether it's eating them, hunting them, or breeding them, the royals had some rules for their medieval animals. First up is how in 1332 a statute passed established the king shall have throughout the realm whales and great sturgeons taken in the sea or elsewhere within the realm. In normal English terms what they're saying is any whales or sturgeons that were caught or washed up on crown ruled soil it had to first be offered to royalty before being pilfered. This law is actually still in place today but rarely ever actualized on. However in 2004 a fun Welsh fisherman diligently complied with the law by offering a sturgeon he had caught to the queen herself. She politely declined the offer. Interestingly enough, the provisions of this statute are expressly protected from repeal by the Wild Creatures and Forest Laws Act of 1971, as it ensures hunting these animals is minimized. Wanna offend a royal? No? Pay attention to your dog, as it's an offense to let your dog mate with any dog belonging to a royal family member. Queen Elizabeth II's corgis of modern day are included, as this law is also still valid now. There were animal laws that weren't just for royals, however, a law said that keeping a pigsty in front of your home was illegal unless it was well hidden. You also weren't allowed to be in charge or ride horses and cows if you were intoxicated, the first drunk driving regulations. And as you may know, even animals could face the judge and jury in animal court for their crimes. Number three, we discuss how excessive food consumption led to restrictive laws on how food and drink were to be made, sold, and consumed. This is a great example of sumptuary laws from the point 10, where the royalty is irritated by blurring lines between them and the bourgeoisie. In 1309, Edward II criticized the outrageous and excessive multitude of meats and dishes that the nobles were eating, emulating the lifestyle of their superiors. So Edward III, in 1336, enacts a law that would have made his daddy proud. No man of whatever rank he shall be shall be served a meal with more than two courses except for certain festivals such as Christmas on which three courses were allowed. Edward III said that many mischiefs caused by the many sorts of costly meats which people in this realm had used was the reason for this decision. But seeing as commoners were practically starving to death at the time, it's obvious where this law was pointed. These laws may or may not have influenced the behavior, but there was no real evidence of any actual enforcement of them. So despite this, the statute wasn't repealed until 1856, but there was no proof of it being used. Scold, and no, not what your mom does when you don't clean your room, is number two. The word scold was used as a legal term for women who disturbed their peers or husbands' peace with quarreling, gossiping, slander, brawling, or even just talking too much. Imagine he left his socks on the floor again, you tell him to put them away, and boom, just like that, you're a scold. While being a scold wasn't a crime, it was criminally punishable, and they had quite a few imaginative and funky ways in which to do so, such as a scold's brittle, which is an iron cage lit or mouth that in case the mouth exterior and interior, ensuring that the woman's mouth opens or even her tongue moves, metal spikes would lacerate and puncture her. Sometimes they would even add insult to injury by parading the woman around town in the brittle to face scorn or by chaining her to a fireplace where she could inhale ash and soot and desperately try not to cough lest she gets the brittle spikes. There was also a yoke, a type of wooden restraint that could either hold one or two people. A woman could be married to wear one alone, sent walking for hours under the disproportionate weight as a punishment, or she might be locked up with the woman she was fighting with, in which case you don't have the discomfort of the way, but you do have the discomfort of staring at your rival's ugly mug for a while. Doing the do and when to comes in at number one. In medieval times, there were numerous religious laws enacted that aimed to restrict the act of reproduction and the times in which it could be done. In a seven day week, a married couple could only engage four of the days. Thursday and Fridays were no no days as people were supposed to prepare for the Holy Communion, and Sunday as well because it was the Lord's Day. In a year itself, the 47 to 62 days of Lent and then the 40 to 60 days of the Feast of Pentecost, relations were prohibited. For the 35 days leading up to Christmas, it was also banned. Anyways, medieval folks considered the eyes important in regards to a person's sexual appetite, so it was also encouraged not to make eye contact during banned periods with someone if you're attracted to them. That I can actually kind of get. It is a romance movie trope after all. Anyways, outside of a religious factor, abstinence during Lent ensured no babies would be born during winter time periods when food was scarce and it was harder to endure pregnancy. Slander is number 10. Imagine seeing some random dude in the market square holding his nose and shouting about how he was a liar. Honestly, wasn't weird under the Norman law from 1066 to 1154. If you committed the act of slander, on top of paying damages to those whose reputation you may have affected, you also had to do the holding of the nose. This law was enacted by Pouty, first king of Norman who had spent his whole life on the throne being called William the Bastard. 
for his parents' unmarried status. In return, he exacted this silly law that required the slanderer to stand in the center of town, as previously described, holding their nose and shouting about their lives. Public humiliation has long since been an effective means of preventing crime. And just about anything. Number 9 is Jenny cragging it. Edward III of England was so tired of his royal court and nobility being heavier set that he made an entire law about it. In 1336, the new law stated obesity made people not able to aid themselves nor their liege lord in times of need. Edward mandated a maximum belt size and also, if you watched part 1, implemented food restrictions, banning more than two courses with the exception of holy days. Edward even defined soup as a separate course to prevent people from calling that a sauce or a condiment. This law lasted remarkably until 1856. Its main purpose in the long run had likely become beneficial economically to ensure that England's resources could be employed more effectively in the upcoming war with the French. Still, regardless, he seems like a fat shaming dude. German purity law is number 8. Beer is Germany's national drink and that's nothing new. The Germans have been indulging for thousands of years. Typically, beer was produced in groups and always made of pure grain. Until the purity laws made by Wilhelm IV in 1516 Bavaria. Germans and most people of the medieval and middle ages didn't drink water as it was often deeply contaminated. They drank beer. The law imposed was aimed at preventing crops used to make bread from being squandered on brewing. So it stipulates that only water, barley, and hops were allowed to be used as key ingredients for beer production. At first, brewers thought this was ludicrous and unusual to decide, but it turns out Wilhelm was actually onto something with this combination. This original law went on to become the core of German beer purity laws that affect German brewing to this day, which makes them the oldest regulations related to food and drink in the world. The only change to it in recent history was the adding of yeast. The Brewers Association of Germany wants the 5th century old law governing how German beer is made to become part of the UNESCO World Heritage List. It would join the Argentinian tango, Iranian carpet weaving, and French gastronomy, among other famous traditions that are considered unique and worth protecting. Protecting. Let's talk sumptuary laws with the Spanish garment laws, number 7 in the countdown. Sumptuary laws, which we discussed in part 1, are placed in to control the nobility and their consumption and displays of material goods. In the case of Spain, there are many sumptuary laws in place as early as the Spartan era. In the 13th century, for example, Siena passed a provision reducing the trains on women's dresses, which was a direct effort to curb a purely aristocratic style. In 1356, the city of Florence proclaimed it illegal for women to have buttons on their clothing without a corresponding buttonhole. And also, no one other than the king was legally permitted to wear a scarlet rain cape. Also in Florence, it was studied how sumptuary legislation around fashion served as a tool to encourage marriage in a society where excessive extravagance of men providing clothing for the women and their families exasperated the custom of very expensive dowries. If her standards were already up, you had to work harder to pay for her, I guess. And a delay in marriage did mean a dip in population. While there are ample examples examples of the laws themselves, similar to many other sumptuary laws, there's virtually no record of their enforcements or punishments. Oftentimes this is because nobility themselves violated their own laws that they made for themselves. Without evidence of how exactly these laws were enforced or whether they were enforced at all, it remains extremely difficult to discuss their social impact, the attitude civilians had towards them as well. Did they act accordingly so as not to face legal difficulties or the payment of fines? Who knows? Not us. So on to the next. Refusing knighthood comes in at number 6. This law was put into place in 1233. Why you may ask? Because simply put, being a knight sucked. If you saw our last video, you may remember hearing about how insanely taxed knights were, but on top of that you had to pay for a ton of mandatory clothes, train incessantly, pay the king for serving him, and don't forget the custom sized armor. You lose or gain weight, you're going to have to pay to replace whole pieces. That's on top of the potential of dying in a battle you just don't care for. No, not many people wanted to be a knight. Roger of Dudley refused to attend his own knighting when he learned he'd have to pay for it. In response to his refusal, Henry III on the spot passed a law against refusing the knighthood. He forcefully knighted Dudley and also confiscated his land to boot. Yikes. Number 5 is the legal protection of claiming sanctuary. Disney's Hunchback of Notre Dame depicts an iconic scene of Quasimodo swinging around on rope dramatically over the burning base of the Notre. Having just saved Esmeralda from an execution, he holds her aloft in the cathedral's terrace and screams out sanctuary. Sanctuary actually predates Christianity and originates far back into the 300s and existed until the 16th century. Every medieval law folded to the protections of sanctuary no matter the criminal's crime. Now, sanctuary seeking criminals might have been required to perform penance or
or go into exile, but they were at least guaranteed immunity from punishment. That's right, you could literally strangle someone and then run to the church to claim sanctuary and no one could come in and harm, arrest, or remove you for punishment. Sanctuary was abolished due to the new tide of judicial law and the arguments of crime, power, and punishment. Also because people should be punished for, I don't know, maybe taking someone else's life. Originally, before Christianity, it was temples such as the ones in Greek and Rome offering the solace, and it was part of the Roman law by the end of the 4th century to have it. Christianity adopted this practice to try and persuade people to join their religion when it started. Even after the Western Roman Empire fell in 476, churches maintained their authority to protect people who had broken major secular laws. Number 4, let's meet the Yellow Ladies. Venice, Italy was an important trading post. Many people came and went, many travelers came to see the great city, but for those who had been at sea for a while, they may have wanted to see a little something else. As a result, medieval Venice was a massive red light district, enjoyed by many before their next voyages. Trying to control the number of ladies working the streets, the Venetian government mandated in 1360 that brothels must be concentrated in the market and port districts. Obviously that just made their industry boom more since it was concentrated right where all the money came in and not dispersed, requiring men to travel farther out in convenient ways. Angry now that they weren't at least getting to capitalize off the potential tax revenue of these women, they in 1420 decided to be accommodative of their lady of the night friends, the Venetian government accommodated more red light districts and implemented safety means within them, as well as the law of yellow. All women of the trade were to wear shades of yellow so as to be identifiable to their clientele, so random ladies just out on a stroll who happen to be in the area don't get harassed. But also it's a little bit of that classic shame tactic of making someone unwanted easily identifiable for discrimination. Number 3 is the indigenous sumptuaries of Spain. As early as 1501, the crown warned natives who carried sword, dagger, or any other weapons that they face confiscation and may be condemned to more punishments according to what the court sees fit. Spanish restrictions against natives developed through the 16th century. This mandate is no surprise as these items, while dangerous, complemented and enhanced men's fashions, and fashionable repairs became integral to everyday masculine attire in Europe. To the indigenous, they had been items of necessity to carry and often seen as symbolic. For indigenous men of the elite, the right to bear arms highlighted much more than their privileged status the way that it did for the colonizer. It demonstrated colonial acknowledgement of their once dominant standing on their original lands and partially vindicated their marginalized reality even as a royal. June 8, 1685, Don Diego Garcia, an indigenous leader of what's now Guerrero, had petitioned to the Viceroy of New Spain to intervene on his behalf when this sumptuary denied him the right his parents, grandparents, and ancestors had always possessed. Garcia was one of 505 petitions submitted by 277 towns between 1575 and 1693 demanding change. In response to a perceived disregard for the law, the monarchy reissued the restriction six more times over the course of the next 70 years. The items requested by Don Diego Garcia reflected both indigenous and European definitions of masculinity. By focusing on European attire and the personal weapons, Garcia took advantage of the social currency imposed by Spanish colonizers. As an elite, Garcia faced decreased political power and increased marginalization under a new regime. Garments and swords provided the ability to visually assert himself in everyday life. Ultimately, petitions submitted by Garcia and his peers reflected not just a request for special status items, but an attempt to assert their belonging as an elite man in a colonial life. Number two is just absurd, but you can club a Swede. If they cross the frozen sea between Denmark and Sweden. What? This unusual law was imposed during the Dano-Swedish Wars of 1657 to 58. King Charles Gustav of Sweden had been planning to cross the Orsund by ship, but the freezing temperatures of January changed that plan. Frozen solid, the Swedes realized that they could simply just walk across. This completely caught the Danes off guard as no attack had been predicted until the spring and they scrambled to compensate. Ultimately, the Danes signed the Treaty of Roxgild and yielded to the territory dispute. But ever since that day, should you see a Swede crossing over the frozen sea on foot, you are legally free to swing a big old club at him. And finally, at number one, you either tuck it or you lose it. Medieval Wales was not playing around when it came to women being violated. If you were caught or perpetrator of this heinous crime, your options were to pay a dowry or get the little man chopped off. 
That's right, a violation such as this was actually considered a theft and was treated as such by the law. Should a perp pay the dowry, then legally the woman's virginity or body was restored in legal parameters. Can't or won't pay the fine? Well then, that was the end of down there for you. The reason for this, other than it being morally right, is that the fines and punishments hope to stop families from developing harmful feuds which would damage the wider society as a whole. This was not exclusive to Wales, however. This punishment shows up in the 1750s code of Constinian Marvodokot in Eastern Europe. It was not unheard of for women to also simply just take the law into their hands either. In a rural area of Shropshire near the Welsh border in 1405, Isabella Grawernus and her two daughters ambushed her, attacked her in a field, tied him up and did the dreaded snip snip and stole his horses to boot. All three women were subsequently pardoned. 